Hey, welcome again to Discovery Church. So glad that you can join us today for this uh, series, Unmasked. I actually want to look into the camera and welcome everyone joining us online as well. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know, we have hundreds of viewers online every week, um, thousands actually, and they come from not only Bakersfield, but all over the nation. So we decided here we're going to start moving in a direction where we're going to have a simulcast of the service and open up a Sunday evening service online so that people can worship and hear the teaching um, if they can't make it to a morning environment. And we're going to broadcast this out um, nationwide and beyond. So excited about that. That's coming in the near future. Is that good news, guys? Isn't that awesome? So excited that you guys are joining us for this series, Unmasked. We're in part three. It's been a really cool series that really what we're trying to do is, is just uncover the areas of our life that we've kind of allowed to be hidden, unknowingly or unknowingly, um, hidden some things off. And, and the, the, the big idea, the, the, the running theme throughout this series, every message, is that God can't heal what you don't reveal. And, and God wants to heal you. He has, he has more healing for you and more freedom for you than I think that we, we realize. And I hope that you're grabbing hold of it week by week, grabbing hold of more freedom and more healing as you walk this out. In week number one, we, we, were, we unmasked our emotional wounds. And so there's, every one of us have been hurt or had pains or experiences that, that maybe we covered up. We didn't get the healing that, that God wanted us to get in the time that, that it was available for us even. And so we... Um, covered it up, and, and, it effect, and it is affecting our life and has affected our life and our relationships. And so we took off that mask of our emotional wounds and allowed God to kind of touch those areas that needed healing. Last week was unmasking our dark side. So the, the hidden side of our life that we don't want no one to see, and that's kind of the whole idea of this whole unmasked series is that we, we can be honest, you guys, we all have issues. Every one of us have issues. There's areas of our life that God is working on. Nobody in here is perfect. And, and if we are honest, we, every one of us would come to that conclusion readily and honestly and say, there is multiple parts of me. Like there's a part of you that is in the public's eye. Okay. Who you are in the, in public, who you are in front of people. And then there's this other side of you, who you are when no one else is around. And honestly, a lot of us are like, we're just disappointed with that guy. Okay. You can't stand that guy. And you don't want to be the, the, that person, but you, you know, kind of can't help it. Uh, and so we have to, we have to, what the Bible says, if one experience healing and freedom, we got to take off the mask. And so our theme verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, Paul says, if you want to, if you want to be changed, you just got to make this declaration. We refuse to wear masks and play games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes. Instead, we, we need a safe place, you guys, and I pray that place is the church today, a safe place for you to, to take that off. Rather, he says, we keep everything we do and say out in the open, the whole truth on display. And see, most of us don't want that because we're afraid of what maybe people will think about that other side of us, that what, they won't like us or accept us as much. But the truth is, we already know, okay? Every one of us has issues. We already know there's another side. And today we're going to discuss what's probably, what might be the, the biggest cover-up of them all. Like if there's the largest mask that there is, I believe is probably in this topic that we're going to cover today, and that is in the area of our finances. Our finances. Uh, but we're, we're seeing this kind of mask, not only in our lives, but on a macro level with our nation right now. Talk about playing a game. Talk about wearing a mask doing or saying, projecting something that is not true on the inside. I think, and I think it's gone beyond just foolishness to like immorality, straight up immorality with the way that we handle and live with our finances. Because when it comes to money, we are definitely appearing one way um, when the reality is the truth is different. The statistics say that Americans live 130% above their income. 130% above their income right now. So we have this growing debt issue. Obviously, it's been well reported. We know about all about that. But that is happening both as on a country level, but also at an individual level. And, I've, and I've, I believe in this philosophy. You guys can buy into it or, or not. But I believe that authority is spiritual. That the patterns that are set at the authority level have implications at the individual level. I believe that. 
on every, on every level. So, so in our government, the patterns that are being set at the authority level have implications of how it's lived out in every individual citizen. citizen. And this is how it is right now. So we don't have enough money? Let's print more. Let's borrow more. Let's get more. So we can keep this out of control spending, our, our projecting and living above that which we can live or should live. And, and I'll just say as an introductory to this co- topic too, that Jesus was not silent on this issue, you guys. He, he, he wasn't. The Bible is very vocal about this issue, about the issue of our stuff, our things, our possessions, our money. Um, in fact, 15% of everything Jesus said had to do with this, with the topic of possessions or money. 15%. It was, it was twice as much as heaven and hell combined, Jesus talked about our possessions. So the Bible is very much not silent on this topic. There are over 500 verses in your Bible about prayer and faith. There are 2,000 verses about this topic. Why? Why, why? why is that? Why is the Bible so vocal on this subject? Because there is a fundamental connection between our spiritual lives and our stuff. There is. And see, some of us are wearing the mask because we think there's a difference and we're operating like there's a difference. So God is in your life in this area, but he ain't coming in over here and it creates this duplicitous lifestyle that we have to wear. We have to wear a mask. So today we're going to unmask our stuff. So let's look behind the mask first, because if you if you were to see the mask, what you would see is a bunch of smiling faces. A lot of people with smiling faces with a lot of stuff. That's what you would see. That's uh, on the mask, okay? But it's like that commercial. I forget what commercial it was, but there was that guy mowing the lawnmower. He's like, I got a new car, new boat, new house, and I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. You remember that? Because that, that's the projection. Is That's what you see, you know, the mask. It's, it's, it's a smile, and it's a lot of stuff. But underneath that mask is something much different. And so I want to give you what you... Four, four conditions that you might be in today if you're wearing this mask. If you've bought into this lie of stuff and you've, you've allowed it to take place in your life more than it probably should, then you are probably in one of these four conditions that I'm going to give you today. So let's get behind the mask. Write these down if you're taking notes. Jot them down. Here's number one. The first condition you might find yourself in today is a condition of distress. You're just, you're distressed. And by the way, you can be, d- distress is not only for those who do not have money, but you can be in distress and have money. You can, be, you can have a lot of money and still be in distress, okay? The only zillionaire in scripture was Solomon, all right? And Solomon had a lot to say about, about finances. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 12, he says this, the sleep of the laborer is sweet. In other words, the guy who kind of keeps it in balance, he kind of works his eight to five, but he doesn't, he doesn't let, he doesn't get consumed with it. That guy gets rest, but he says, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich man, the guy who's always trying to get more, the Bible says, permits him no sleep. He has no peace. He has no, no rest. He's worried. He's stressed. So today, if you're stressed out, if you're in distress, whether you have it or you don't have it, all right, this message is for you today, okay? You might find yourself in that condition underneath the mask. There might be some distress going on. The second condition you might find yourself in, write it down, is discontented. Discontented where you're just not satisfied you just, with what you have. In fact, there's a lot of people who believe what I call the myth of more, right? That, that more is always the solution, more, if I just had more money, I could pay my bills. If I just had more margin, I could. If I just had more, which you might be right, right? like you might, that might be true, but just statistically, the facts show that it's not true. That's not actually what happens when we get more. Over 90%, the studies show, okay, so here's our standard of living, and here's our income. This is the average person, okay, lives this way. Our standard of living and here's our income. And then, oh, if I could just get a little bit more, if I could just raise this up a little bit. Yeah, when that happens, guess what? This doesn't stay there, does it? It don't. I just increase my standard of living again. And the studies actually show that the, the more income you have, the larger that gap becomes. 
Because the principles that you set down here are only magnified up here. So you might find yourself a little bit discontent today because you bought into that myth, the myth of more. And that's, that is a lie. The myth of, of, of more is just not true. I want it now. Here's another Solomon scripture, Ecclesiastes 5.10. Whoever loves money never has enough. I mean, if you're in love with it, if you're in love with stuff, man, you can never have enough stuff. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. And the studies is showing that that is true. The average balance on the credit card, on a credit card today, is over $9,000. Listen, listen, please. It will take $29,000 to pay off that $9,000 over its lifetime. I hope you enjoyed your stuff. Okay? I hope you did. I hope you liked your stuff that much. Okay? Because sometimes 90 days ain't the same as cash. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Write down that prophetic word for somebody. God, oh my God, I'm not going to. Yes, that's for you. Discontented, man. Because we just need to get back to this. I love Dave Ramsey. Have you guys listened to Dave Ramsey, Woo! Financial Woo! Peace University? Love that. Dave Ramsey says, you ever heard you need to act your age? Act your age. Dave Ramsey says, we need to get back to a place where we're acting our wage. Okay, just, just stop, stop, act, you get, stop living above your wage, just act your wage. We need to come back to that, to that place, you guys. In 1 Timothy 6, 6, not in your notes, but, but he says, godliness with contentment is what? Is great gain. Man, I gain when I add contentment to my godliness. Man, we need to come back to that. But under the mask, that, that, that might be the condition you're in, maybe distressed, maybe discontent. Or it could be this third condition, disconnected. Disconnected. What do I mean by that? I mean like you're, you're doing this on your own. You're, you're doing something that God always intended to be done with Him. There's, there's over 20 verses in the Bible where God says, ask me. Like God wants to be involved in your life. Not just part of your life. Not just like, okay, God, I'll give you... Here's where you operate, but don't come over here. Like you've, you've discon you're, you're living disconnected from God in this area of your life. And what would it look like, man, if you involved God in your life in this area of your decisions? What would your financial picture look like if you involved God in that process more? I tell you, we would make a lot wiser decisions, wouldn't we? We would we'd probably be more content. We we probably even have less stuff, okay? <laughs> you have a lot less stuff going. But can I tell you something? Look, God, God does not mind you having stuff. I hope, please hear this. God does not mind you having stuff at all. Like, he actually loves that you have stuff, he wants you to have stuff. He actually gives you stuff, but he just doesn't want your stuff to have you. Are you hearing me? That's, that's, where, that's where we, because we think we have possessions, but in reality, it's possessing us. Because where the, the place it has in our heart. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 17. It says, command those who are rich in this present world. And by the way, that's you, All right? You say, Jason, uh-uh, you don't know me. I ain't rich. No, you are. America still is in the top 3% in the world, human civilization of wealth. That's, that's, and if you think you are not, just go on a mission trip, all right? Go on a mission trip and see real poverty. Or, or, or go, to, go down to the Dream Center and see real need if you think that, that you are are not rich. He says, command them to do this. To do what? Not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but instead, here's the key phrase, instead, put your hope in God. Man, we got to get back to that perspective in our lives, because he is the one who is richly providing us with everything. Look at this. For what? For our enjoyment. Like God wants you to enjoy your stuff. God is the one who's actually providing it to you so that you can enjoy it. He loves to see you enjoying stuff. He just does not enjoy seeing the stuff owning you, okay? And there's a difference. So, all right, here's the fourth thing. You're in one of the four conditions, possibly, I would bet. You're either distressed, disconnected, discontented, or the fourth one here is distracted. Distracted. Where, I mean, it, that stuff has got your eye, it's got your attention. It's got your focus. I mean, it's what you think about. Even sitting in here today, you're thinking about, ooh, it's a good day for me to get some stuff. Uh, what are you thinking about? Well, you can, go, you can go eat something, buy something, go play with something, go entertain by something. Right now, you're battling it right now. In your mind, you're just thinking about 
stop, it's distracting. And, and I'm telling you, Americans have, have forgot about it. We've forgotten the purpose of why God blesses us. And I think we've forgotten that, that, that God prospers us not to just continually raise our standard of living, but he prospers us to continuously raise our standard of giving. And that's the truth. That's the truth. God wanted to bless us. And honestly, I'll just say boldly, you guys, that that wealth doctrine that shows up in some churches today, it dishonors God. It does. That prosperity theology and teaching is built on a half truth. Yes, God does want to bless you, but he always intended to bless you so that you can turn around and be a blessing to others. That was the purpose of God's blessing in your life. And we've, we've lost that. As, as a nation, we've lost that because now we're looking to others to help us. We can't turn around. We're looking to others to help us so that we can continue this out-of-control lifestyle. And look, that's happening at a, micro, at a macro level. We see that on the news. But could it be it's happening at a micro level in our lives as well? We got it all wrong. Luke chapter 12 says this, 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 this guy, maybe you can resonate with this guy. He says, and I'll say to myself, you got plenty of good things laid up for yourself for, for many years. So this is what I need to do. Since you're so rich, take it easy. More vacations, more trips, just, just, just more stuff. I need to eat, drink, and be merry. Man, I need to play with my stuff. That's what, I, that's what I've been building it up for. But God says, you're a fool. You're a fool, he says, because this very night, you didn't know, you're going to end up in heaven this very night. Your, your life will be demanded from you. And who's going to get all the stuff you prepared for yourself, what you've been working for all these years? And Jesus makes this powerful statement. I want you to see it today, church. And this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. In other words, we've gotten distracted. We started focusing on making this better here. And, and, and check it out. If Jesus could like be your financial advisor for the day, if you can have Jesus to be your financial, sit down at your kitchen table, bring out your budget, your spreadsheets, your bank, whatever, and you can say, look, Jesus, I need some. This is how it would go. I promise you. You'd be like, you'd be telling them what's going on here right now, your problem now, your focus now. Look, this is what I need, and this is what's going on. If I get, And Jesus, his response would be, but look to the hills. Where does your help come from? Can, look, look at the eternity. Can I get you focused on heaven? And there would be this big disparity on what you're trying to show Jesus and what Jesus is trying to show you because he, would, he knows that this life is just a mist. It's a vapor. It is so short. And he would try to be getting your focus on something that is so much greater. So let's get real today, you guys. Let's take off the mask, and, and I want to boldly declare some truths today out of God's word, that they are the reality. This is the truth. God's word is true. What God's word says about finances, about money, about your stuff, that is the truth. And I want to give you this verse out of Haggai chapter 1. It says this, give careful thought to your ways. And that's what I want you to do today, man. I hope that God, just, just give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but you're not getting anywhere. The debt is still climbing. You harvested little. You eat. I mean, you get your, your, your fill, but it's never enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're never warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. So could it be that we're in the condition we're in because we have bad policies? Okay, and I'm not just talking about at a macro level. Could it be at an individual level that we're in the condition we're in today because we have the wrong policies? And some of you don't have any policies, and that's, that's a problem, okay? It just, you don't know where it's going, okay? Could it, could it be, you guys? And I want to just give you some, then what's, the question becomes, what are the right policies then? What, what's the right, right way? How can, what's, the, what's the truth? Let me, I want to give you four truths today. That, that will help shed the light of Christ on this subject. And it, can, it has the power, really, to, again, set you free and bring healing into this area of your life that you could be masking up one of those conditions. Write these down for me today. These are four truths. Whether you believe it or not, man, this is the truth of God's word. And if you were to kind of approach it honestly, you would discover this first one here, and that is that God owns it all. 
God owns it all. And with that belief, just that belief right there can bring you so much peace, can bring so much transformation into your life. Because when it's somebody else's stuff, I don't know about you, but it just takes the pressure off a little bit. Because it's not, it's not my stuff, okay? And I have to do that when I come up here even to preach and to teach. And, and I, tell, I tell God every week, like, okay, God, this is your church. It's not my church. This is your church, God. And, 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 if, and if it grows... And if it's, you know, if there's change that happens and miracles and power and, and you show yourself with signs and wonder, which I expect you to do, God, I expect you to move in power. If that happens, God, I'll give you all the glory. But God, this is your church. God, if it doesn't happen, if I go out here and I fall flat on my face or whatever it is, and it just doesn't grow, miracles don't happen, God, I'm still going to give you all the glory because it's your church. And it just is a liberating principle that just relieves so much press, pressure it all belongs to god and guys please please listen to me i'm not talking about your tithe or and your offering here it's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about everything 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 belongs to god like your your car your house the other 90 percent your your kids some of you are like god can have them back that's okay you can <laughs> No, but everything, your breath, your life, your, your, your ideas, your, your creativity, your, your pool, your house, everything belongs to God. I'm telling you, it's one of the most liberating principles that you can live by. First Chronicles 29 says this, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory, and the majesty, and the splendor for everything. Check this out. In heaven and everything on earth, say it out loud, everybody. Everything is, everything is yours, God. It all belongs to you. And I'm telling you, that'll just take the pressure off right there. And, and I watched my kids, and when my kids were young, they, they didn't know. They're so simple and innocent, and they just come to the to the kitchen dining room table and they just they don't know how the food showed up it just got there you know they just they just live so simply they don't know how the presents got there on christmas or birthdays or whatever it's just there's just this innocence about them but as they grow older and they get a little bit more of the world in them and the pressures of the world and the frustrations of the world and actually as kids get older they start to leave the nest and the comfort and the provision that we as parents provide which is by the way supposed to happen they're supposed to they're supposed to do that, but God says, Jesus says, you're to come to the kingdom of heaven like little children. So we, this is how the kingdom of heaven is. We're supposed to come to God like little children, coming to the table simply, innocently. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know where it comes from, but you own it all, God. It's yours. That's how we're to come before God like little children, the Bible says. Not too long ago, I was in a store, and every time I'm in the store, the kids... How many of you guys know it? The kids ask for something. They got to ask for something, okay? Every time. You can't take these kids anywhere. They ask for something. And then these thinking stores, they put all this, this little knickknack stuff at the, right at the checkout. They call it something, too. They call it impulsive buyer's rack. Did you know that? That's what they call that rack. It's called the impulsive buyer's rack, okay? And they got all the candy right there. And my kids, just like your kids, can I get some candy? And I usually I say no. You know, I'm just like, no, no, no. But this time I'm feeling a little generous and stuff, and I, had, I just had Abby with me. The other two kids were Veronica. We had separated, meeting up after checkout. So I say, sure, get some, and she loves those blue dolphins, those gummy dolphins. You know what I'm talking about, those gummy dolphins? She loves those things, package of them come like 10 or 15, 12, I don't know, there's a package of them. We get in the car, and guess what? The other kids didn't get a snack. They didn't get, they didn't get candy at the checkout with mom, but Abby did. So I'm in the front seat, and I'm hearing this play out in the back, and, and Caleb's like, What? That's not fair. Hey, Abby, can I get one of those? And, and what do you think Abby said? No. They're mine. I picked up on, wait a second. Hold on. Abby, can you share with your brother? Get, let me give you an opportunity here. Can you share with your brother, please, Abby? What did you think she said? No. They're mine. Little did she know. <laughs> That those gummy dolphies were mine. 
And daddy had the power to forcibly remove those gummy dolphins from her, okay? I also had the power to buy 20 packages of those dolphins if I wanted to and rain them down upon her head, <laughs> showered with gummies. She didn't know. If only she would have responded to my question with, Oh, Father, <laughs> thine art the gummies, and everything I have is yours, God. How many of you know how to bless her socks off? Man, I I, every time I went to the store, I would have got her gummies just to enjoy her watching the, those gummies. Man, I'm telling you, that's the, and look, listen, God is the same way. He's the same. God is. And, and we've forgotten that, and we've lived erroneously with this ownership mentality when nothing is ours. Everything belongs to God. Naked I came into the world, naked I will leave, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And when you live that way, I'm telling you, with a sense of respect and honor before God as owner and creator of everything, I'm telling you, the God who has the power to snatch away your gummies has also the power to rain, I'm telling you, and he will rain down gummies on your head. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's just, you need to know that God owns it all. But if he's the owner, what does that make me? Here's number two. I'm his manager. Okay, if he's the owner, I am his manager. There's this biblical word. It's called stewardship. See, my job is to steward. And that, what that biblical word means to steward, it just means that, that what you do is you go to the person who owns it and you manage it in a way that reflects their interests and desires. That's what it means to steward it, because it's not mine. I'm, I'm just, I, it's, it's, nothing is mine. And by the way, let me just say to you that this topic has been so misused and just abused in church to just manipulate people. Can I just let you breathe a little bit? We're not taking up any special offering or anything today. We ain't building anything. There's nothing special going on at all. It's not, it's not about that, because look, stewardship is not about giving more. That's not what it's about, okay? Stewardship is, is about rearranging your entire life to reflect the truth that everything belongs to God. That's what real stewardship is. So the question comes, how am I handling his stuff? So if nothing is mine and everything I have is his, how am I stewarding? How am I handling his stuff? Because none of it's mine. It's about focusing our lives on God's agenda and honestly it's easy to get away from all this you guys where where this is this is what belongs to god and this is this is mine and we can live that way like like this okay uh this is yours god but then the rest is is mine can i tell you something it's a test that that is that is a test and some of us are passing that and some of us are not he asks us to return a portion of what we make directly to him. He asks us to live generously, but even the stuff we keep, we think it's ours. It's not. We are stewards. We're managers, and he is testing you. And and if you are wondering why you don't have enough, it could be because you're not passing the test. I mean, if you had a business, and you had people who were managing that business for you, and that business kept decreasing in growth every year, it just, it just, you, you'd, you'd have to get rid of that manager, wouldn't you? Because he's not being a good steward of your business. Jesus is the same way. I'll prove it to you in Scripture. Look, Luke chapter 16. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little. See, it starts, it starts at a young age. I mean, you want, it, you want God to bless you? Oh, I don't have, I don't have, no, no, no. The principles that you use right here is just going to magnify the principles that you're using up there. And God says, look, if you, if you are, if, you're, if you can be trusted with very little, you can also be trusted. I can bless you. I can pour out blessing on you. You're going to be trusted with much. But whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you haven't been trustworthy in handling your stuff <laughs> with your wealth, Who's going to trust you with true riches? And it's a test, you guys. God's, God's the owner. I'm the manager, and we got to get back to that. Here's number three, the third truth. That is God's plan works. we got to come back to that, you guys. The beauty of God's plan, using his word and his standard as not living disconnected, saying, okay, this part, God. No, no, but actually letting them into this area of your life and saying, God, 
I'm going to do it your way because God's plan. And so I get asked sometimes, like, Pastor, like, why, why did God say 10%? Why the tithe? Why, why is a tithe 10, 10%? Can I give you my educated answer to that? I have no idea, okay? <laughs> and I have questions myself that when I go to heaven, I'm going to ask God, hey, what? Because God could have said 15%. He could have said 20%. He could have said 2%. He could have said 90%. I don't know why he said 10, but I do know this. God does not need my money. God wants what my money represents. He wants my life. And the most sensitive nerve in the body, some of you medical people in here know this, the most sensitive nerve in the body is the nerve that goes from your heart to your wallet. <laughs> some of you feeling it right now. You're like, ow, oh, that's uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, 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 but God, it, I'm telling you, his plan works. Up here on the screen, not in your notes, look here, Deuteronomy 14, 23, the purpose of tithing is, so let me give you God's, God's purpose, this isn't me, this is the word of God, God's purpose for tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. That's it, right there. God wants to be Lord of your entire life, not just part of your life. Look at Malachi 3.10. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That's, your, that's the church. That's where you get fed. That's your spiritual family. That there may be food in my house. Now, that's ministry and vision and, and provision. And, and that is like dream centers and church plants and feeding homeless and gospel advancing. That's, that's, and if you are, so if you're, can I just say, if you are a, if Discovery is your home, like this is my home, this is it, can I just encourage you to do something? Tithe. Let's get there together. Like we can get, and, and by the way, I don't know who ties and who doesn't, I w but I would be doing a disservice to you and to God if I did not preach the truth of God's word, okay? And I know, I know that there has been some televangelists and religious people who have muddied this topic, making it hard for a pastor like me to lead you in truth in areas of healing and freedom on this topic because people have jacked it up and stuff. But I, I, can I just tell you that, that, the tithe is not about us. It's not about the church. It's not about, it's not even about God. Like, it's for you. So that what? So God says, because if you're faithful in that little, and I see that you're faithful in little, man, I'll tell you, I, won't, I will throw open the floodgates of heaven. I will blow out blessing and provision on your life so much you can't even contain it. It's not about the money. It's about your heart. It is. It, it, it's, it was always in, for those of you that, that, that are not, um, there yet, that's okay. You can, what I always say is pr get, just pray and be led by the Holy Spirit. There's a Proverbs chapter 3 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with your first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. See, it's not about, okay, it's not a, a, about God or it's not about the church. It's, it's actually for you. All right, that's the truth. Here's the fourth principle. And this principle is, a, is more and more a reality of mine. As our parents get older, my father passed away just several months away, and, and, our, and our parents are getting older. My wife and I talk about this. We talk about it more regularly than we ever have before, and it's the reality that our life is just a mist. So here's the fourth truth that I need to give you, and that is heaven, not earth, is my goal. That's, man, that's my home. That's my home. I'm just a stranger here passing through my goal is to focus everything I have on Jesus and eternity. And, and, and there's this, I want you to know something about, if there was like a stock, stock trade thing going on, if someone knew about, you know, some stock that was going to double, and they kind of, and you got in on that because someone told you a day early, or if, someone, if, if something was going to crash and, and you got in on that, you took your money out on that stock a day early because someone told you, that's called insider trading, and you go to jail for that. that you, people get in big trouble for that type, of, that type of stuff. But Jesus, this next scripture, Jesus gives us the best insider trading tip that you will ever see in the entire scriptures. Look at this in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, look, I got an insider trading tip for you. This, all this stuff here, is anyway, don't store it here. Don't store up your treasures on earth here. Because this is going to burn. It's in this place where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But he says, store up. Check this out. Store it up. Not for Discovery Church. Store it up. Not even for God. What does he say? Store it up for 
yourselves, sort of for, for you. You're actually investing into your eternity. For yourselves, treasures in heaven, because they're no moth and rust. They don't destroy it, and where thieves don't break in and steal. I'm telling you, you'll never be disappointed. The more time you pour, the more you pour your money, your ideas, your life, your breath, your house, your just where you say, God, how can I leverage everything? Leverage my entire life for your purpose and for your kingdom, for eternal things, because that's the only thing, you guys, that really matters. And I would say, like, that's, that's not only, like, what matters most is this point, that heaven, not earth, is my goal. But I would say it's, like, the only thing. It's the only thing, which, which means, like, if you, if today you're not right with God, nothing else matters. What nothing else you do in life matters or what you've done. If your heart is not right before the Lord, because I'm telling you, he's coming back. And the way, that, the way that I see the Bible and interpret prophecy, like Jesus can come at any day. And whether he comes down or I go up, we just don't know. And maybe you're here today and you don't, you don't know. And this is the most important thing that we can do, is, the, is to not focus, not get so distracted on the things of this world, but to, but to start looking for our eternal security. So let's start right there. Can we bow our heads and close our eyes all across this worship center? I need to start right there with you. You're here today and maybe you're just, God forbid your life would be asked of you this day like we read about and you would stand face to face before God. But I want you to, I just want to ask you, are you ready? Are you ready for that? Jesus said you're a fool if you had all this effort that you lived your life towards the things of this earth and you did not become rich towards the things of God. I want to give you an opportunity to get right with God. Not joining a church, not, not fixing anything, not, no. I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ into your life. See, you're here today and maybe you've never done that. Can I just... Jesus already paid the debt of your sin. He already paid the price. You can't earn it. You can't do it yourself. There's nothing you can do to earn or get forgiveness. The only thing is through the grace of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, meaning you surrender the light, your life to him, make, make him Lord, give him lordship, and not just a part of your life. Don't compartmentalize him. Make him Lord of all of your life. He wants to be Lord. He said, if you, if you confess that, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You'll be made right. And maybe you're here today and you've gotten distracted with earth, with things, with stuff. Maybe for the very first time, you're ready to you just give your life to Jesus today, to surrender and make him Lord. Maybe, maybe for some of you, you, you've just been distracted. Like, you know, Jesus, you know, you go to church, you know, but you just got distracted. And you're not stewarding your life. I'm talking about everything in a way that reflects the interests and the heart of your father, of the owner. And you need to come back. And you just bring your life back under his lordship, every part. So you're here today, and that's you. Every head bowed and eye closed. I want to pray for you. And I want you to just respond to the Holy Spirit. Just begin to, he's already ministering right now. Just respond to the Holy Spirit. Yes, God. Thank you, Jesus. I need you. Tell him I need you. Thank you, God. Yes, God. With every head bowed and eye closed, I want to pray for you. We have some prayer partners up to the front, but that, you don't need to come up. You don't need to, I'm not going to single you out. I'm not going to have you stand up. I want to pray for you right where you're seated. Do me a favor. And when you boldly just lift up your hand right now and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. I surrender. Yeah, amen, 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 amen. Praise God. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, join us. Praise God. Amen, amen. Go ahead and put your hands down. Pray it like this. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I need you. And I don't want to do it without you. I don't want to live without you in any part of my life. So today, I surrender to you. Every part of me, God, is yours. Completely forever yours, God. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Give me a fresh start, God, and a clean slate right now, God. I receive you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. God, I pray for every person here that has 
wear, kind of donned this mask, and underneath is just distress and disconnected and discontented and distracted, God, that today, God, we just would remove that mask and stop putting our hope in the wealth and in riches of this world, but we would turn and put our hope in you, God, that we would leverage our life as stewards, not just a part, but every part, every Thing, leveraged for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give God praise if you receive that word today. Amen. Amen.